is uh, Andreas Slotte with uh, Oikos Student Reporter. I'm here with Professor uh, Steve Keen from the University of Western Sydney. And uh, we're going to talk about alternative economic models, or perhaps, in your opinion, the sort of more true or, or correct form of uh, actually the Yeah, well, the, the models that actually are models of the economy rather than a, a, a dressed up version of comparative advantage, which is all the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models really are. They're, they're neither dynamic in the genuine sense, nor are they general. So. Um, you know, if they were general, they'd be multi-commodity, and they gave up multi-commodity decades ago because they couldn't get the mathematics to work out, and Peron Trevenius proved that back in the 1930s. So, usual bizarre nonsense of neoclassical economics. But let's take a look at a way of doing dynamic modelling using the Minsky program, which um, I've developed to the stage it is now with a grant from INET, and I'm now trying to get uh, Kickstarter funding, hopefully in the next uh, week or two, to get um, hopefully a massive increase in the amount of money. We've only put fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth into it so far. I like to put 20 times that much and get a totally professional program written. So this is a very early version of the software. It's similar to uh, what are called systems engineering programs, systems dynamics that are commonplace for engineers. So packages like VizSim, Simulink, uh, XCOS, Modelica, uh, they're all well known by engineers. And then in the in this sort of social theory analysis, you get programs like VenSim, Stella, I think, et cetera, et cetera, which a lot of social uh, social scientists know about. Economists have been completely insulated from both groups. There's this tribal isolation of economists where they don't talk to people in social sciences and they don't understand what people in engineering and physics are doing. So this is a very common tool. I've now adapted it for use in economics. So uh, what I'll do is I'll use it, first of all, as, if, as you could use any of the other programs. So I think mine, uh, if I've, I've, having used all the other software packages, I'm aware of what I see as limitations in the interface or the fact that it's hard to use. I've tried to make it as easy to use as possible. So like all these programs, you use the design palette down here where you put objects that are part of your model. And up here you have a palette where you can enter various objects. Now the thing which makes this program unique is the one I'm highlighting right now called a godly table. And that's in honour of Wynne Godley. And it's a double entry bookkeeping view of a banking system, which of course neoclassical economics completely ignores the banking sector. I'm saying they're fools to do it and you need to have a capacity to model the banking sector, but I'll build the first model, which is just a, a real output model, <coughs> and this looking at a cyclic economy. So what you're largely trying to determine in a model of the economy is GDP. So I create a variable here, uh, give it the name of GDP, and I'm not going to give it a value now because it's going to be determined what happens elsewhere in the model. So I click on OK, you've then got the little mo a variable which sticks to your cursor until you click, there's GDP. Now, I'm going to work with an abstraction of a no-growth economy here, quite simply, to make it as simple as possible. And of course, what I'm building, neoclassicals would say, would reach equilibrium, because without it, there's no government sector, no trade unions, it should you know, reach equilibrium. I'm sure they'll have other reasons to reject what I do. I know exactly what they'd be, but I'm going to ignore that as I build this for you right now. I'm going to start with, I'll call this lab prod for labor productivity, which is a, a, a parameter. Let's say it takes one, one worker produces one unit of output. Having created that, I've now got labour productivity, and these are the mathematical uh, components of the system now. If I bring down a divide by component, I can now divide GDP by labour productivity. So I now click on the wire mode. Again, we'll make this context sensitive at a later stage of the program. So GDP divided by labour productivity will tell you how many workers you hired. So if I click now on a variable called workers, which is now determined by the other two, so again, I don't give it a value. And now they've got workers, if I know the population, and I'm going to, again, with work with no, no growth system, so constant population, so I'll call this pop, and give it a value of, say, 110. So I've now got a population. But if I divide workers by population, I've got the employment rate, another variable. So we have emp rate here. And bring down divide by block. I can wire this up a bit later, I'll keep on going here. Now, we all know Milton Friedman, mm -hmm. and his argument that there's what he called the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Well, let's presume Uncle Milton is right, and let's get a variable called Nehru, and say that it has a value of 0 0.95, meaning with the, when 95% of the workforce is employed, there's a, the wage will remain constant. But if there's 96% of the workforce employed, or 4% unemployment, then there'll be a gap, which means wages will rise. So I now need to subtract one from the other, to get the, the gap between actual employment and the so-called Nehru rate. And then if I multiply that by what I'll call Phil Slope for, for uh, Bill Phillips, who by the way is a 
much much greater thinker than uh, you would you get to, told to believe in conventional economic theory. But I'll say this is the slope of the Phillips curve is say 10. So if unemployment is 1% below the Nehru rate, then workers will demand a 10% wage rise. That's the rate of change of wages now. So are, are you assuming it to be linear? The, the yeah, I mean, this is actually, I'm doing it importantly, I'm, sh I'm making linear assumptions okay. all the way through, okay. simply because, uh, according to neoclassicals, you know, they, they often believe that if you get any cycles in a system, it must be because you're imposing the cycle by assuming non-linear relations. So I'm assuming absolutely nothing, that, that's a really good question, thanks for asking it, nothing but linear relations in this model, okay? So I've now got the Phillips slope, now that's the rate of change of wages. What I now need to do is have a, a dynamic equation for the setting of the wage level. So I need an integrate block here. This is still a slightly complicated, but I'd like to make it more obvious. So I'm going to change that and integrate it with the variable system later. But if now I right click or double click on that, I can edit the name from int, which is a default name, and call it wage. And let's say the initial value of the wage is one. Now, if I then right click again and choose copy variable, bring it down here, the wage multiplied by its rate of change integrated is the wage. Basic name equation. So I bring in another multiply block here, and if I wire all this up, I've now got the pretty much as far as I need to get, I can now derive the rest of the model by tying it all together. So I've got GDP divided by labour productivity is the number of workers, uh, workers divided by properties and the employment rate, subtract from Nehru is the rate of, is the, is the gap between the stable, so-called stable equilibrium rate and the actual rate, multiplied by the Phillips curve, uh, Phillips slope, it's how much wages change, Model that by wages and integrate it, you have the actual wage rate. Now having done all that, if I then multiply the wage by the number of workers there are, so I'll copy that and bring it right down here, right click and choose flip to turn it around. If I now multiply that by the wage, and I'll bring that down here and flip that. Let's just wire that up now. So bring the wage down here to the top, workers down the bottom. Well that's now going to be the wage bill. So let's create that variable. Bring it down here, flip. Now that's a very ugly shape. Though, so you can bend the line by clicking on the blue dot. So then I've got the wage bill. Now if I subtract the wage bill from GDP, I have profit. Let's flip that around. So let's have another variable called profit. And it's a very simple model. I'm just going to assume that capitalists invest all their profit, which of course would mean the capitalists are being uh, you know, very magnanimous, they're not hanging on to any consumption for themselves, but it's, you can change this latest by adding additional real world complexity. So rather than you start from the unrealistic and move realistic, which is the way you should work with modelling. Now investment of course is the rate of change of capital stock. So I bring down into a block here, flip that around, call it capital, and I've got to give an initial value to any uh, system state as it's called. Let's say there's 300 units of capital. And then if I divide capital by the accelerator, which we normally use the symbol of V for, and you say it's normally value of about three, so flip that around, divide that together, I now have enough to define GDP. So I've now got a typical dynamic model, it's cyclical causation. I just need to bring a couple of extra blocks here. I've got to have a subtraction block there to subtract the wage bill from GDP to get profit, and that should do me. Let's wire this all up now. So I've got there's the wage bill. Subtract that from GDP. Ah, whoops, I made a mistake then. It's quickly, it's actually good to do in a demo. So if I drag this away and right click, not on the blue dot, but when the blue dot turns up, I get the chance to delete a line. We've made it possible to have multiple additions wiring it just to you know, add multiple things by wiring them all to the plus block there. Uh, again, there's one of the little tricks that I, I think is better than I've seen in other systems dynamics programs. So that's now profit, profit becomes an investment. Investment is integrated, becomes a capital stock, divide capital stock by the accelerator, you have GDP. Let's just wire that up. No, you have close loop. Yeah, you now close the system. So in any, any dynamic model, you actually go back at a causal loop, but of course, you must have a rate of change somewhere inside there to make that same. It's not an algebraic loop, it's a differential equation loop. Let's bring some graphs down now. Bring on a couple of graphs. And I'm going to graph, I'm going to create a couple of variables. If I divide the wage bill, let's make a copy of that put it up here somewhere, and I'll just flip that around. If I divide the wage bill by GDP, then I've got worker's share of output. So I'll just call this, it's called this wage's share, wage share of output. 
put that up there. Let's just bring another divide by block down and wire those up together. Okay, and I'm going to check the part of the simulation between this thing called runge cutter. There's many ways of simulating an online system, but uh, you have to have a set of set of parameters in. I've got a two larger step size there. We're going to make that 0 0.01 to make it smooth, otherwise it'd be very, very jerky. Okay, and let's take a look. Bring copy a copy of the wage bill down here. Wage versus the employment rate over here, and let's get the same two over here, but I'm going to put the employment rate, whoops, pardon me, there's a little bug, see that? Sometimes these things happen, we've still got to line iron all those out. Yeah. I'm going, Was going, 600 hours that you put into this? 600 hours, that's all. They're very competent programmers, you can tell, let's put this together. Now, I'm going to put the employment down the bottom here, and you'll see why in a moment. Okay, let's put it all together, and according to Uncle Milton, mm -hmm. we should reach equilibrium. Oh dear. Anything but equilibrium, permanent cycles. Okay, with no nonlinearity assumed or forced onto the system, all linear relations. The reason you get nonlinearity is because to get part of your result, you're multiplying the wages, which is one variable, mm. by the number of workers, which is another. Mm. Okay, so two variables together is a semi quadratic. So nonlinearity in a in a real system actually comes out of the structure of it. You don't need to force it on by an assumption. In fact, if I had a nonlinear Phillips curve here, I'd make the cycle less extreme. Okay, linearity, non-linearity confines things to realistic ranges. So it's easy, I mean, there's a very simplistic model that you created here. Let's say if you wanted to add something like, you know, in uh, inflation expectations that's going to adjust your wage expectations or something like that, I'm assuming that's rather easy to... Yeah, implement. you just basically change your equation over here. Well, again, at the moment we don't have the capacity to group easily. I'll show you, there is grouping. If I just go for that like lasso here and I choose that little box there, and then I can now lab label this uh, wages share. So I don't need to actually see that particular bit. That's hidden some of the complexity. But we haven't yet written the code so that you can actually drill down inside them and edit. That's in the next few weeks we'll be writing that. Uh, so that means you could structure the whole thing and have quite a complicated and, and, and realistic. You know, you wouldn't need to make ludicrous assumptions about being able to forecast the future. But you could have people reacting with the time lag to current data, maybe making a forecast, which would turn out to be wrong, of course, because all forecasts are, especially those made by economists, etc., etc. So you could build all that complexity in there. And the idea, for example, the population, what I'd do, I'd quite, if I just actually quickly do this, if I then had, uh, say, call this, pardon me, not, not here, I'm going to bring in an integral block. If I came here and said, let's call this N, for the number of people in the, in the society, uh, and I get an initial value of 110, mm -hmm. then I could define a differential equation for that to say the rate of growth of population is some function of, of um, you know, of the number of population that currently exists. So like a simple equation for that is to say there's a constant rate of, uh, I'll call it PG population growth, let's say it grows at 1% uh, per annum, okay? Then if I say PG multiplied by the current value of N, integrate that, back it here, wire that up, is the population, and then if I just uh, delete that block there, oh, wait, yeah, you like it good, <laughs> you're never quite sure with the <laughs> early version of software, and wire that up, then I'm now going to have a system where there's a growing population, so let's just stop that and simulate that and see what happens, you still get cycles. Okay, but now what you've got actually is a growing, if actually there's a recording the GDP, which let's bring a graph of that inside here. So bring a graph down here, getting pretty mucky, but again, I can just make a bit of space there. That's why that went about a bit. Okay, and then make a copy of GDP here. Whack that there, wire that up. Boom, okay, and then play. And I've now got cyclic growing, it won't be a lot of growth, but there'll be 2% growth per annum in the level of GDP coming out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Th thank you. Uh, thank you for the th very thorough introduction. That's only uh, half of it. We well, haven't shown you the monetary modeling yet. Right. Take a look at that. Uh, can we do a second part too? Yeah, sure, for sure.